Well, happy Resurrection Sunday, everybody. Man, am I on? Hello? Okay. I don't hear myself like normal, but that's okay. Well, hey, it's so good to see everybody today. As they, uh, Sean was just sharing with you about um, this connection card, we are asking everybody to fill that out just so we can update your information to make sure that we have everybody. One other thing that we have for you, uh, Garrett, if you can put up the poll slide for me. Uh, we want to poll you this morning so you can get your phone out and uh, you can actually text this. So you're going to text the number 97,000 and the code is LU poll. And basically, it's going to pull up some options for you, and uh, we'll let you know what comes up. And what is this for? I want to know what you're interested in and what you would like to hear us speak to on a weekend or maybe a series of weekends. And, uh, and so you can, again, text the number. So it's, you, the number is 97,000. The words that you put in the text field are LU poll. One, just no spaces. So LU poll. Oh, see, somebody... Right now, finances is winning. So there you go, one response. And, uh, and so you can fill that out. We'll show you at the end of service. You can do it between now and then. And, um, and so it's just going to help me to formulate some things to help know what you're... Woo, hello. Hello. Love some feedback. So that's not the kind of feedback I like. I like to hear from you, not from the speakers. And uh, so, hey, we are so thankful that you're here today. Thank you for coming and and uh, just uh, spending Easter with us. So thankful that you've chosen to be here today. And uh, so uh, hopefully you have a seat now. I know we were a little crowded there for a minute, but um, hey, and so as uh, Sean said, you can fill this out, but also at the end, we'll be doing some stuff on the back. And so today I wanna jump right in uh, into what my message is. And so my title is today is Once and for All. And uh, I'm going to give you the main scripture verse, and then so I'm going to start off with it, and then we're going to come back to it towards the end. But uh, <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, it says, For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now, whether you realize it or not, this is excellent news. Uh, it, it's incredible news for every one of us because of what it says here is that God had a plan because how many of you know that we were born into sin? In other words, we were born with our issues. We were born with problems that we could do nothing about. We were powerless to change ourselves. And God says here is that his plan, his desire was to make us holy by the body of Jesus. And it says, and this is the key part that I've highlighted for you, once for all time. Once and forever. In other words, it's not something that has to be continually done. What Jesus did on the cross, as he said, it is finished. Not like, hey, let's hit pause and we're going to come back to it. Like, hey, what needed to be accomplished is going, it has been accomplished. And so today, what I desire to do is to actually give you a little bit of context as to why we celebrate uh, Easter. And so how many of you uh, participated in communion at home on Friday? Had, uh, Anybody have an interesting time with your kids, like me, trying to do communion with your children at home? My kids kept wanting to eat the snacks, and I'm like, they're not snacks, leave them alone. And, uh, you know, and so come to find out Friday, they had broken into the crackers, and so I had to go get some different ones, because I'm not going to take some stale crackers. And uh, maybe you did, but I did not. And so, hey, I appreciate you doing that, um, if you were able to participate with that. Uh, really, the whole idea was to be able to take church home. And really for you as a, as a family to do that together, I think that's such a powerful thing. And so I commend you for doing that, for participating with that. And, um, and so today I just want to jump in though. And so we're going to take a little bit of a trail, a little bit of a walk before we come back really to this. And uh, I really want to kind of wrap what we call Good Friday. If you were a Jewish, you would call it Passover. Um, and, and so, and really what all that entails and what this means, what the Bible has to say about why we celebrate Easter. Uh, because how many of you know that it's much more than just D Jesus dying on the cross? It's much more than him just going to the grave. And it's actually more than even just him being resurrected from the dead. Those are all elements of Easter, but you got to have all of them to matter, right? I mean, because you can't have resurrection without a death, Right, And there were some things that Jesus accomplished. And so I want to show you uh, some things. Before I get into that part of it, 
I want to, in John chapter 1, uh, John the Baptist, who was the forerunner to Jesus, so the Bible had prophesied, it foretold that there would be one who would come before the Messiah, and he was a little bit of a strange guy. He was out in the wilderness, and he looked a little crazy, probably sounded a little crazy, probably acted a little crazy, and, uh, but yet people were drawn to him, and so they kept thinking that he was the Messiah. They kept saying, oh, are you the one? Are you the one? Are you the one that was promised? And, and he would tell them no, and so one day this delegation comes from some of this spiritual elite of the day to come and ask John, hey, who are you? Are you, a, you know, are you the Messiah? Are you a prophet? Like, what's the deal? Who are you? And so in uh, John chapter 1, verse 22, they asked that question and said, all right, because they had asked him, are you the Messiah? He says, no. Are you the prophet? He says, no. And they said, okay, then who are you? We need an answer for those who have sent us. And it says, what do you have to say about yourself? And John responded with the words of the prophet Isaiah, and he says, I'm a voice shouting in the wilderness, clearing the way for the Lord's coming. Now, you may not know this, but John the Baptist and Jesus were actually cousins. They were approximately six months or so um, in age difference. And so they were familiar with one another. They knew each other. They were raised together. They probably played together and all kinds of stuff like family does. As, how many of you got some cousins that you had some fun with growing up. And uh, that's what you do, right? I mean, you, you play with your family and you have, and so they had this relationship. And so the, the dialogue continues. And so they're kind of going back and forth. And in verse 29, it says that the next day that John saw Jesus coming towards him. Now, remember, John the Baptist knew him in the natural. He knew him as Jesus, the boy. He knew him as Jesus, my cousin. But yet John makes a declaration here this next day, and he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so John has a moment where it's not just a natural thing, but it's actually a spiritual thing, and he's recognizing and really uh, calling out the destiny that Jesus came for. And it's interesting here, the, the verbiage, and it matters. It's not just a random title that he gave him, but he says, look, it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the of the world. And to really understand this, we're going to have to jump back into the Old Testament uh, a little bit in, in, in Exodus chapter 12. And this is where we get the idea of Passover. Uh, it was really the original concept, if you will, of what today we call communion. Uh, and so we're not going to dive in all of the detail, but I want to show you something because as my title says, is that once and for all, you know, the Bible says that Jesus fulfilled all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And if you go and do a little research into this, it's not like two or three. There's literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. There were 300 prophecies just about Jesus' um, birth, death, where he would be. I mean, there's 300 uh, foretellings throughout the Old Testament that said, hey, when this comes, this is the guy. And so we're not putting our faith in somebody that we just kind of like a shot in the dark, like, well, I hope he's the Messiah. We actually have a lot of confidence from Scripture. There's actually over 800 prophecies in the Old Testament that foretold the future. 300 of, over 300 of the 800 were specifically about Christ. And so we're not just kind of throwing a shot in the dark, you know, it's like playing darts blindfolded. How many of you know that's not a good idea? <laughs> I guess it's a good idea if you're the guy throwing the darts, but if you're standing around, probably not the best idea. No, we can have confidence. And so the Bible tells us what Jesus has accomplished and done for us. And so I want to jump back into Exodus 12. And so let me give you a little context here as to what this is about. So the children of Israel are in bondage at this time in the nation of um, in, in Egypt. And so they've been there. M many of you have probably heard the stories of the plagues. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, hey, let my people go. And Pharaoh, the Bible says that his heart was hardened uh, to it. And so he said, no. And then he said, no. And then he said, no. And so nine plagues come, right? Different things. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You got locusts, you got frogs, you got the water in the, all the water in the land turned to blood. I mean, Pharaoh was an interesting character, I mean, I don't know how hard your heart has to be after all of those things to keep saying no, 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 but he did. And so the 10th one was the final one. And God makes a statement. And so you have the children of Israel and they're enslaved in the nation of Egypt. And you're like, why are we talking about slavery in Egypt? Because we were all born slaves. Maybe not physically, but we were all, the Bible says we were born slaves to sin. In other words, we have no choice. Left to ourselves, we are very sinful people, and we need a Savior. 
And so today, it's important that we understand that for a Savior to come, there had to be a price to be paid, and that's why Jesus came. And so we do celebrate Easter, and so, but there's some interesting things that happen, and so I want to show you here in Exodus chapter 12, I'm just going to read a couple verses here, because God gives the nation of Israel an instruction, because the tenth plague was an angel of death that was going to be sent, which sounds terrible, because it is. And the truth is, is that every, somebody was going to die in every home. Now, the nation of Israel had a decision. They got to choose if it was going to be their firstborn son or if they were going to honor the Lord and sacrifice an animal. But death had to happen in every home in Egypt. And, and so God is giving them instructions to the children of Israel and says, hey, I want to keep you separate as my special people. And so he gives them instructions about the animal. In verse 5, it says, The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defects. In other words, it's got to be flawless, perfect. So go out there, find a sheep. If you don't have a sheep, take a goat, but it's got to be perfect. And he says, And take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or their young goat at twilight. And it says, uh, they are to take some of the blood and to smear it on the sides and the top of the door of the houses where you'll eat the animal. It says that same night uh, that they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter uh, salad greens and bread made without yeast. Drop down to verse 12, and it says, And on this night I will pass through the land of Egypt, and I will strike down every firstborn son or, and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. And God says, I will execute judgment against all the gods of Israel, for I am the Lord. He says, But the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are say, staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague of death will not touch you even when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, this doesn't, you know, I know this can sound like a, a crazy horror film a little bit. I do realize that. But what God is doing is He's saying, look, a price has to be paid, it's non negotiable. But when you apply the, the blood of the, of the sacrifice, the vertical post, the horizontal post, He says the angel would literally come to the door, see the blood, and move on. In other words, he will not come in and do harm. You could actually take it as far as say the angel would not enter the house to render judgment because of the blood. In other words, the blood became the barrier. It's the only thing that would stop death from entering the home. And so what happens here, and now many of you are familiar with me, and I'm a numbers guy. I like numbers. Numbers speak to me. So let's just do a little math real quick. So there were approximately 2 million Jews from what the Bible tells us that were delivered out of Egypt because after this night, Pharaoh says, hey, y'all can go. And God sends them to their promised land. So there's approximately 2 million Jews that were delivered out of Egypt. If you take each family, if they each sacrificed one lamb to celebrate the Passover, because remember God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over your family. So if you estimate that each family has five people, that's 400,000 lambs sacrificed every year at Passover. Can you imagine what that night sounded like in Israel? 400,000 every year, because this was done once a year. And really what this is, it's a type and a shadow of what Christ would do for us. In other words, it's God saying, hey, is it, this is just a symbol, and it will do for one year. But next year, you're going to come back, and you're going to have to sacrifice another animal. And we also read where the high priest would go in once a year to the most holy place and he would take the blood of these bulls and goats and, and he would take it before God and, and they hoped that God would accept it. In other words, their sins weren't forgiven, they were just covered up for another year. It's like writing an IOU until one day somebody could actually pay the price. And so we continue with our math lesson here. Pardon my nerding out, but this is who I am. So, so get this. If Passover was celebrated annually for 1,400 years, which is a pretty close representation, maybe off a couple years, but it's pretty close. I, heard, I read that there was 1,400 and 1,500, so I went with the lesser of the two. So 1,400 years between the implementation of Passover to Jesus. 
So you have 1,400 years till the cross from that day. So you have 400,000 a year. That's 560 million lambs and goats. 560 million. That's a big number. I didn't read that in the Bible. But every year this was done. Why? Because it was waiting for the day that Jesus would come. Because just as John declared, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So 560 million, that's a whole lot of animals. That's a whole lot of sheep and goats. They were actually, can you imagine? Because people would come to Jerusalem. They built a gate just for the sheep to come in. You ever read about the sheep gate in Jerusalem? That's what it was for, where people would just bring their animals through. Because you got all the people coming in over here. And the sacrifice is coming out over here. And so I want to fast forward a little bit to what we participated in, and hopefully you've already participated in even this weekend, which is communion. The last supper that Jesus has with his disciples. So for 1,400 years, you have, this is the way Passover works. You have bread, you have wine, and you have a sacrificed animal. That's what's on the table every year. And it was a, a ritual, it was a routine, it was a custom. And they knew this routine. And they did it every year, waiting for the one day that the Messiah would come. Because if you were Jewish, you grew up understanding what that table meant. Was that somebody was coming to redeem you. But you were waiting. You were waiting for that day to come. You were waiting for the appearance of him to be. And then at the Last Supper, we, many of you know the story. Jesus is sitting with his 12 disciples. And they're probably looking around a little confused. Because they see the bread and they see the wine, but they're thinking, where's the lamb? Like, where's the meat? Some of you say, where's the protein? How would you like it if you sat down to dinner and you got some little glass of some sweet tea and some bread and you're like, well, here's dinner. And you're like, no, it ain't. Where's the food? But see, these guys grew up with the custom understanding every year of their life. And they're looking around going, something is missing. But in reality, nothing was missing. Actually, something was about to be fulfilled. And so what happens, and in truth, is that there was no lamb on the table because the lamb of God was at the table. And there's a big difference. See, the disciples didn't know this, but Jesus knew this. And he had been trying to tell them, hey, guys, I know you've got an idea of the way this thing's going to go down, but it's, it's going to be different. And so I don't know why they didn't ask him, because even he leads them in what we would call communion today, which is, hey, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And, and this cup of wine represents my blood, which is what? It's the price that's needed to pay for your sin. Do this in remembrance of me, right? And so he gives us basically the framework of what as believers in Christ, now what our Passover looks like. We're not looking to a lamb to redeem us. We have a savior who has redeemed us. We're not waiting on an IOU. The price has been paid and we now get to stand and what? Be redeemed by the blood of Christ. And so even when things go haywire in the world, there is, if you will, blood on our doorpost already. And it's not the blood of bulls and goats because that could never save. It is the blood of Christ. And so even when the enemy comes, and wants to knock on your door, he can see the blood on the doorpost figuratively of your house. And guess what? He has to move on. I would encourage you, go read Psalms 91. If you're like, I don't know if I believe that, go read about it. Those who stay in the presence and in connection with God, what? No harm will come near you. Only with your eyes will you see the destruction of the wicked. These are promises to us from the scriptures. And so I want to give you a couple of things here that, that tie in with this. We already looked at the first one here in John 1, 29, where John says, behold, the Lamb of God. He prophesied that three years before it happened. So three years before Passover, John spoke that. 700 years before that in Isaiah 53, verse 6 and 7, says the Lord laid on him, being the Messiah, Jesus, the sins of us all, he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was like a lamb being led to the slaughter. And we see that. 
You see that with Jesus, even when he's with Pilate. Pilate's like, yo, dude, like, don't you know I have the power to give you life and let you go or to crucify you? And Jesus just stays quiet. There's not an account of, of Jesus responding when they're hurling insults at him. When he's paying the price of, of, of our salvation, the Bible says that he was beat beyond recognition. I mean, that, that's pretty brutal. And yet he never responded. Why? Because he understood. I, the, later on in Isaiah 53, I believe it's one of the most beautiful scriptures in all of scripture, is that Jesus says when he sees the reward of his sacrifice, this is the David translation, his response will be, you were worth it. Because when he was being beaten and when he hung on the cross, he actually had you and me in mind. And so when he sees it, the Bible actually says that when he sees the reward, he will be satisfied. What a beautiful scripture. Is that Jesus won't be like, man, you guys didn't measure up. You guys didn't quite get where you needed to be. He's going to say, no, 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 no. You are worth it. Because he sees things very differently than we do. Jesus declares this at the Last Supper in Mark 14, 24. It says, and he said to them, this is my blood which confirms the covenant. Modern translation is the contract. The contract or the covenant, which truly contracts are flimsy, covenants are not. A covenant is an oath. In other words, you swear to death. A contract you can get out of. But we don't understand covenant. Marriage is a covenant. God doesn't deal in contracts. God deals in covenants. And when you are in covenant, what? You swear to each other's well-being, even at your own expense. Well, how many of you know that Jesus swore to our well-being at his own expense? And he willingly, the Bible, I love the scripture where it says that somebody comes to him and his response was, is that no one can take my life but I willingly will lay it down. In other words, at a moment of time, he could have said, I'm out of here, I'm not doing this. And sometimes I think we think that like Jesus isn't human, but he was because he went and prayed three times in the garden and said, God, if there's any other way, let's take that route. I would rather do it a different way, but not what I want, what you want. And then after that, of course, he, he is arrested. And, and so, you know, but... And so we see this, and so Jesus says that there's a covenant between God and his people. And, and he says, it is poured out as a sacrifice for many. See, all of those 560 million animals that were sacrificed were just a symbol of the one who would come with perfect blood. Because the book of Hebrews tells us that the, the blood of bulls and of goats and of, of sheep were never enough to purify from sin. And we can read throughout the Old Testament where there were times where the priests would go in and there were articles even in the, the tabernacle. And yet the Bible says that there's an earthly tabernacle and there's actually a heavenly one as well. Well, Jesus didn't go to the earthly tabernacle to pay for sin. He went to the heavenly to do this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, for God made Christ this is important. God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So what this scripture literally is saying is, it, it, it's right here if you just see it, is that God made Christ who had never sinned, who was perfect. Now we can't understand perfection because we're not perfect. But God made Christ. The Bible says that he laid upon him the price necessary. Isaiah 53 talks about this. The price that had to be paid. And, and you can say, man, I don't understand all these sacrifices. I don't understand all this weird stuff going on. Because, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain. I believe I have a way to help you understand, grab hold of this in just a minute. But it says that God made Christ who never sinned to become an offering for our sin. So God made Christ sin and he made us righteous through Christ. The only way to find righteousness is in believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way. I know that's not a popular statement today. Well, there's many ways to, to God, not according to the one who laid down his life and rose again. 
because all these other guys who said there's another way are, are laying in a tomb today. So I don't think they quite have the, um, the resume that can compare. And, it, and I know there's like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll dabble in a little conspiracy theory. Is that people say, oh, well, the disciples went and got the body of Jesus out of the grave. Okay, let's think about this for a moment. How many people laid down their life before they would deny their faith in Jesus? Would you do that for a conspiracy theory? I would not, I can tell you. Because there are some people that believe that, oh, Jesus didn't really raise from the dead. Somebody just stole his body and they put it somewhere else and all of these things. There were many people, all of the apostles, all were martyred for their faith. And many others, there are people right now all over the world who are being martyred for their faith. There has to be some reality to this or why would somebody willingly do that? And yet people have been doing it for thousands of years. And so this is important to understand is that God has made us alive unto Christ is that when Jesus died, that wasn't the end of the story, nor was it the end when he rose out of the grave and ascended to heaven. Like, let me just give you a little Easter trivia here. Have you ever thought about when Jesus is risen from the dead that Martha comes to him and says, where have they taken him? And she thinks he's the gardener. She doesn't recognize it as Jesus. And finally he says, Martha. And she looks and she's like, Jesus. And she runs up to him and he says, don't touch me. And he says, because I've not yet ascended into heaven. But then you have doubting Thomas who says, I won't believe unless I put my fingers in his hands and I put my hand in his side. And Jesus is like, come on. Well, what's the difference? When he was resurrected on that morning, he had not yet gone to heaven to do his priestly work to pay the price of our sins. He could not be defiled. He had to remain perfect, and that blood had to be undefiled. Therefore, he could take it into the heavenly temple and pour it out before God. That's why he said that. Now, Hebrews chapter 9, I want to read through a few scriptures here. Because I believe that these are important. I would actually encourage you, if you've never read or really paid attention, the book of Hebrews can be a confusing book if you don't understand the imagery of it. But if you can connect the dots, it makes a lot of sense. And it actually tell you a lot about what Christ has done for you. So really starting kind of the mid part of the book of Hebrews, starting in chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, it talks about Christ being our high priest. And what it's really saying is that, hey, those old high priests of the past, Jesus is the ultimate. What these guys had to do year after year, and they had to serve, Jesus came to settle it once and for all. Again, those priests were just a type and a shadow of the one who would come. And so that's what the book of Hebrews, much of it is about. But you can go there reading, you're like, man, this is kind of strange. This is very different than the rest of the New Testament. It is, but it, the book of Hebrews was really written for a Jewish audience because they understood exactly what they were talking about. And sometimes we struggle because we have a Western mindset, but let me remind you, the Bible was not written to people of a Western mindset. And so we have to understand and change our mentality to look at it differently. I mean, I know this may shock you. God is not an American. <laughs> like when you get to heaven, there will not be an American flag. We will not stand up and sing Star Spangled Banner. No, we will be singing worship and praise unto God. Right? Right? And we would do well to remember that, that we, don't, that, that we may live in a democracy here in our nation, but heaven is a theocracy. In other words, it's a God government. It's much more akin to a monarchy, except one that could be trusted. But this is important. So here in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, it says, So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. I could have highlighted all the good things. When Jesus died, there was nothing but good things on the other side of it. Good Friday was the worst day in history, but it was the best day for us. Why? Because Jesus was laying down his life for us. 
So it says that he's now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of, of goats and of calves, he entered the most holy place once and for all. Now you can read that two different ways. Once and for all, as in once we'll never do it again, or you can look at it as one time for everybody. So let me say it another way. It's one time for you, one time for me. It is finished in this moment that what he was doing was paying the price and his price was enough. Yeah. Jesus didn't come up short at all. So it says that he entered the most holy place once for all time and he secured our redemption forever. Forever. Is that Jesus went in and he did what he needed to do as the priest. The Bible says that he cleansed the heavenly temple. Now there's a, some theology around that, but I'm not gonna get into it today. Well, I thought heaven was perfect, so why would he have to do that? You can go do some research on your own. There's your homework, you're welcome. So drop down to verse 14 of, of Hebrews 9. It says, just think about how much more the blood of Jesus will purify our conscience of sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. Now think about this. In the Old Testament, when a, when a lamb was sacrificed or a goat was sacrificed, their sins were just covered for a moment, but their mind was not changed. In other words, they were fully aware of every sin that they had ever committed. And they were hoping, looking forward to the day that Jesus would come. But yet here it says something very different for us, this side of the cross. This is one of the really differentiating factors between us and them. It says how much more the blood of Christ would cleanse our conscience. In other words, when I look back into my story, I, it really feels like I'm talking about somebody else. Is that I don't have to deal with the shame, the guilt, the weight, the embarrassment. No, that's who I once was, but I've now been what? I've been buried with Christ and I've been resurrected in new life. And the Bible says that God can actually wash my mind and my thoughts. My soul can be washed by what? The blood of Christ where even my sin doesn't remind me anymore of it. And some of you have, have, are saved. You've asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, but you've yet to experience that. But the Bible says in no uncertain terms that how much more will the blood of Christ purify, cleanse, wash your conscience. There doesn't have to be a stain of your past when you've submitted it to Christ. And it says, and so some of you may struggle worshiping. It's probably because you still have some thoughts on your mistakes as opposed to remembering that you've got blood on the doorpost that was shed for you. And because I know not just did Jesus save me, but Jesus has now washed me clean. The Bible says that when I receive him, that I become white as snow. The book of Psalms says it this way, is that when we're forgiven, is that God remembers our sin no more. It says it's as far as from the east is from the west. And so when we understand that, it makes it much easier for us to worship God. Why? Because we, we know that we have a Savior who paid the ultimate price for us. It goes on here and it says, for the, by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for your sins. Perfect sacrifice. Nothing. Remember, go select an animal with no defects. Christ offered himself as the perfect sacrifice of our sins. See, we can stop paying for our sins when we submit them to Christ. We can quit trying to be better and, and do all the, the religious uh, back and forth, the Jew do all the stuff that we wanna do, trying to, I mean, it, it's amazing the acrobats that we try to do to fix ourselves, only to come up short every time. But yet here, the Bible says is that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. In the second part of verse 26, it says, Now, once for all time, he being Jesus, has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. It says, just as each one is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. 
Remember in Exodus 12, God said, I'm going to execute my judgment, but if I see the blood, the judgment will pass over you, right? So sometimes people get freaked out about Jesus coming back because they're like, oh my gosh, I got to get my stuff together. I need time to sit down and process before Jesus shows up. I got to make sure. I, I, I ask God for all forgiveness before I get to heaven. That's why your conscience needs to be clean, for one. But it says just as each person is destined to die, and after that comes judgment. That freaks a lot of people out. But it goes on, and it says, so also Christ was offered once and for all time as a sacrifice to take away, not just to cover them up, but to take them away, the sins of many people. It says he will come again not to deal with our sins, Please hear me today. When Jesus returns, he's not coming to deal with our sin because he's already dealt with it. That's a huge difference. So many times we can get worried and just concerned and the weight of that can fall on us. And it's like, oh my gosh. Like we have to know that Jesus was enough. And it actually says that when he comes back, he's not coming back to bring judgment. He's actually coming to bring salvation to those who are eagerly awaiting him. Let me help you out. If Jesus split the sky right now, if you've committed your heart to the Lord, you have nothing to worry about. You're like, yeah, but I'm not perfect. How many of you know that God doesn't want you perfect? Even better, God doesn't need us perfect. Why? Because he sent a perfect one already. So when Jesus comes back, he's bringing the fullness of the salvation that we believe in. It says that he's bringing salvation to those who are eagerly awaiting him. So why did Jesus have to shed his blood? Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? It was necessary. Go read Isaiah 53. It gives you verse 4, 5, 6. It will spell it out pretty clearly. The Bible says that for us to have peace, there was a price. For us to have healing, there was a price. It says that his body was broken for us. Peter said it this way, is that by the stripes of Jesus, there were 39 lashes on that whip that they hit him with, and they all have significance. That wasn't a random number. But it says by Jesus' stripes, we were healed. It's not our, it says were. Don't take my word for it. Go look in your Bible and see what it says. By Jesus' stripes, you were. In other words, the bill's already been paid. The, the bill for your joy, the bill for your peace, the bill for your health and your healing, the, the bill for your provision, it has already been paid by Christ. Hebrews 9.22 says this, is that without, or it says there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Sin demands a response. Romans 6, 23 says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the wages of sin is death. So let's just role play for a moment. How many of you got a job? How many of you get a paycheck with that job? Does anybody have a job you don't get a paycheck? Just curious. So how many of you know that with your job comes a wage? Is that benevolence? Is someone just being gracious to you? It's like, well, you know, I'm just going to sit at home, but y'all can just pay me anyways. Like, no, you got to get up when you don't want to get up. You got to go to work. You put in your time. They don't prepay you. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but you get paid after your work is done. Why? Because there is a wage that is owed. It's not charity. It's not kindness. You owe me my money. Have you ever gone to your boss and be like, thank you so much for, no, you walk in there, hey, uh, it's payday. My check did not come in today. I'm going to need you to figure that out. Why? Because there's a wage that you are owed. Right? How many of you would just not get a check and not say anything about it? <laughs> I would not. I'd be like, yo, payday. I will come back when I get paid for what I have already done. And if you don't pay me, I will not see you again. Because there's a wage that is owed. Sin has a wage. 
And just like you expect to get a paycheck when you've worked a job, God expected for a price to be paid for sin. It's no different. So just as with the Israelites, they were saved because of the death of lambs, we can now be saved from eternal death because of Christ's blood for us. It's like the symbol for us, it's more symbolic, but it, there is the blood, and I know people can get kind of weirded out about that. We're one of the few cultures that don't do animal sacrifices, by the way. Most of the world understands this. Now, you can determine what you think about it, but I'm just saying, for us, it's strange. But much of the world understands covenant, especially if you go into more tribal areas, this is a given. I mean, sacrifice has been done for as long as humans have been alive. I mean, you can go into cultures that know nothing about the scriptures, know nothing about God, know no, and yet they'll have sacrifices for one who was gonna pay the price. They may have different language to it. It's the gospel. They just don't know the names. Why? Because the Bible says that eternity has actually been established or placed in our heart. And I believe that we all know we're broken and we need somebody to fix us. And we know that we're incapable of doing this. I believe we're hardwired. It, it's in us. So let me circle back all the way back to where we started in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. It says, for it was God's will, or for God's will was for us to be made holy. That word holy means blameless, perfect, spotless. It was God's plan. It was God's intent to what? To make us holy but it can only be done by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it was done once and for all. Once and for all. What Jesus did is enough for you. For all of you. The best of you, the worst of you. The parts you celebrate and the things you wish would just go away. Jesus doesn't pick and choose the sins that he forgives. He says, no, my blood is powerful enough. You know, as I was just spending some time yesterday and I was reminded of a, of a lyric from a, from a song that talks about how the blood of Christ will never lose its power. It's just as powerful today in 2023 as the day it was spilled on that cross. It never loses power. And the same blood that will redeem us and cover us and protect us is still available to us today. And this is important. Why? Because it was once and for all. And so, yes, we identify with, that's really what baptism is about. We say that what? We're identifying with Christ's life, but we're also realizing that, hey, I need to die in him. Like there's a part of me, my sin nature, it, it, as we go down in baptism, we go into the water and say, hey, this is signifying the death and the resurrection, raised in new life, raised in power. Is that I'm not left to myself, you're not left to yourself to figure this thing out, but God wants to put his spirit on the inside of you. Yes. That what? That will enable you to live a life that is holy. Not perfect. God is not looking for perfection. He doesn't need perfection anymore. He already has it. But he does need our willingness. He does need us to, to work and, and to do our part but it's with his help. It's not on our own. And so without Jesus' death, there's not a resurrection to celebrate. But because there's a resurrection, because he had a resurrection, we can now have a resurrection. And the Bible says that we can come alive unto him. Just as his dead body got breath again, is that God wants to give us not just really new life, a whole lot of a better life. See, this is important is that his death becomes our death. His resurrection becomes our resurrection. His life becomes our life. So I wanna go back and I wanna just share one scripture, well, technically three. John 1, 15 through 17 is one portion. This is back where John the Baptist is declaring that Jesus is the lamb who would take away the sins of the world. It's actually in the verses just prior to that. And I want you to hear something because many of, many of us, myself included, have struggled trying to live a New Testament post-cross life with an Old Testament way of living. In other words, I'm still trying to do the Ten Commandments. I'm still trying to, to figure things out. I'm still trying to do my best. Man, I'm working hard. I'm doing all the things I know to do, but it's all futile. 
I mean, I always like the joke is that, you know, we can't even remember the Ten Commandments, much less keep them. If you think you can, rattle them off right now. I can get to about seven or eight, and then I really got to think, which one am I, fist, am I missing? But yet here in John chapter 1, verse 15, it says, John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one that I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. Well, John was born before Jesus. John was older. And yet here, he says, he existed long before me. And I love this part of the scripture. It says, for from his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law, the Old Testament, was given through Moses. But God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. So in other words, the Old Testament tells me that I'm messed up. The New Testament tells me that I can be fixed. Amen. See, the Old Testament is, is really identifying the problem. In the New Testament, post-cross, the life of Jesus is telling me God's response to my issue. And God's response to my issue was love and faithfulness through Jesus. God's response to your issues is love and faithfulness through Jesus. And I love that it doesn't just say that by his unfailing love through Jesus. It says his love and his faithfulness, his steadiness, his consistency. In other words, he didn't just love me in a moment. He still does, and he's consistent, and he's faithful to his word, and he still has good things in store for every single one of us. See, almost every other approach when it comes to, to pursuing God and, and, and higher thinking or you can get into new age, you can get into all these other religious beliefs, they're all gonna tell you the same thing. You gotta do this, you gotta do that, you, need, you gotta spend this much time, you gotta pray X number of times a day, you gotta meditate, you gotta do this, you gotta get your consciousness to a certain level. Well, how many of you realize that's everything you're doing to get to another place? All of those are futile. So he'll say, hey, you got to do A, B, C, and D to, to achieve the goal. But Jesus, really, his resurrection declares that this is what God did for you. And so now you just have to receive it. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. In other words, before your first sin, before my first sin, God already had provided. We're not like those saints of old that believe God in hope and in faith that one day a Messiah would come. They were looking forward to something. We get to look back at something and say, no, that Jesus paid the price for me. See, Jesus is not looking for your perfection. It's impossible. None of us are perfect. I made the joke last week, but I'll repeat it because this works. If you're looking for a perfect pastor, go find you a different church because I'm not him. And I need a savior as much as every single one of you. So I'm not standing up here from a position of, of authority, if you will, or somehow a, 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 of an elevated thing. No, I'm just as jacked up and broken as you. I just freely admit it. And I recognize, man, that I need the power, the goodness, the grace of God in my life. And so Jesus is not looking for, for perfection, but what he is looking for is movement. Another word you could say it this way is that Jesus is not looking for perfection, but he is looking for maturity. He is looking for development. He is looking for growth. We're not perfect, but I can tell you this, I've been serving the Lord for 25 years this year. This summer in June, 25 years I've been serving the Lord. And I can tell you this, where I started is not where I am today. And I, I, with all of my heart, my belief, I, I kind of make the joke in the natural is that, man, when I was 30, I look back at that 20 year old, and I was, man, that boy was stupid. He didn't know nothing. He thought he had it figured out. Turned 40 a couple years ago and I looked back at 30 and I thought, man, that 30 year old didn't know much either. He's pretty dumb too. And I hope when I get to 50, I'm gonna look back and be like, man, that 40 year old, he thought he was something, didn't he? That's funny. Well, what about spiritually? If I can look at myself naturally, and look back through my life and track my progress or the lack thereof, what about spiritually? I mean, some of us, man, we track lots of things. We track our money, we track our health, 
right? We, we track the things that are important to us, but we never actually track or, or even give a thought to our spiritual progress. Well, that progress is what brings about maturity. And God wants us all to develop. That's what maturity is, this development. I mean, me and my wife are right on the cusp of coming out of baby slash toddlerhood. Praise Jesus. <laughs> Not quite, but we close. I can see the finish line. I'll appreciate it once we're past it. No, I want to appreciate the moment. But hey, I want you to take out this card today and flip it over on the back. It looks just like this. Every one of you got one of these. And there's at the top, there's an A, B, C, and D, and I'm gonna tell you what these represent. And I'm gonna ask you to give some thought to this card for a few minutes. Because my question for you is where are you at today? Where are you at in your spiritual life? Because you need to know. Because the truth is, you're one of these four. You're somewhere on this spectrum, if you will. We don't get to opt out of it. We're all a part of it. And so A here is this, and I'm gonna ask you to check which one of these today. A is that, hey, I'm already in a relationship with Jesus, like a real relationship, not like I go to church. No, like, man, there's something happening on the inside of me. Like Jesus is alive on the inside of me. I know we're celebrating Easter and we celebrate his resurrection 2000 years ago plus, but what about his resurrection in you? Is there some reality there? So that's A, I'm already in a relationship. B is, hey, I'm beginning a real relationship with Jesus. You may be like me, man, you've gone to church a bunch, but there's no real life change. My criteria, this is my personal, what I see from scripture. Am I saved or am I not? I don't know, have you changed? And I don't mean that as an accusation. I mean that as in, when I go read the Bible, when people encounter Jesus, they would change if they, if they were following him. Now, there were people who hardened their heart like Pharaoh, like the Pharisees, like different people. But people begin to change. Their life begin to change. I mean, you go look at the apostles. There's a lot of change happening in those guys. Why? Because there was a, a process. And so you may be here today and say, hey, man, I need to begin that relationship. C is also important, which is, hey, I, I need a little more time to consider it. And I want you to know, you may not be ready to make the decision today, and that's totally okay. Because I would rather you take time to consider it than to make a decision in a moment and then walk away later. So I actually value C. It took me a long time. I was raised in church. But I'd never surrendered my heart to the Lord. I'd prayed the prayer many times. But no one ever actually told me it was okay to consider And I want you to know today, it's okay to consider, to take some time and say, hey, you know what? I don't know if I'm ready to commit my heart to Jesus. I don't know if I'm I'm really willing and and ready to make him the Lord of my life. If that's you though, I want you to identify, hey, this is where I'm at today. And D is, hey, I don't ever intend on making that decision. And if that's you, thank you for being honest. Now I will tell you this, if, if you fall in that D category, we are gonna pray for you. We're not gonna show up at your door. We're not gonna embarrass you. But if that's you, just own it. Because so many times that D stands more for delusional than anything. Because we think by not making a decision, well, I didn't make a decision. By not making a decision, you make the decision. And so if that's where you're at today, okay. Just acknowledge it. Like, hey, this is where I am. Every single one of us are somewhere on this. The next part right below that, it says, what's my next step? We believe that everybody has a next spiritual step. And and so there's just a couple things here. It's like, hey, I'm expressing my faith in Jesus. That would be along the lines of B, possibly C. But hey, I'm expressing my faith in Jesus. I wanna be baptized the way that Jesus was baptized as my public declaration of faith in him. The next one say, hey, I'd like to find out more about the church. We can get in contact. We'll give you that information. And then other ones are saying, hey, how can, I, how can I get more information about being part of a group? Is it Sundays are great, but you need community. You do. You need, you need people. I was listening to some this week, and, and I thought it was funny the way that they worded it. They said, you need a friend that has refrigerator rights. You know what I'm, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Like, they don't ask. They just go and grab. The rule in my house was if you have to ask, you probably don't belong here. 
That was kind of the way my mom grew up. She'd be like, what you asking for? If you're in the house, you're welcome to the fridge. Well, sometimes we all need those friends, but I mean, that takes some time and it takes some, some intentionality, some effort to be in relationship. And so if we can help you in taking your next step, check one of those. Look, our ushers will be at the doors as you exit today. They'll collect these. Look, I promise you, we're not gonna hound you. If you're here and you're a guest, today is our gift to you. We want nothing from you. We want nothing but God's best for you. And I mean that genuinely. And so if you would take the moment to fill this out, and uh, I wanna pray this morning over you. I actually wanna lead you in a prayer of salvation today. Because I realize there may be people in the room, there may be people online today that have never made this decision. And the truth is, is that Jesus did sacrifice himself. He did lay down his life for you. And so I wanna lead you just in a, in a quick prayer. The Bible says you have to believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you have to confess it with your mouth. You gotta say it out loud. Like, well, why? Because the Bible says so. That's why. And so I'm gonna ask everybody to pray this with me today. So would everyone just say, dear heavenly father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for all that he has done for me. I thank you for his body that was broken for me. I thank you for his blood that was shed because it forgives all of my sin. I ask you right now, Holy Spirit, to cleanse my conscience of everything wrong I've ever done. I receive right now the forgiveness of everything and I trust you with it right now. Father, I thank you that you're equipping me with your ability to become everything that you've created me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, just as a sign of support to those that are making this decision, this prayer this morning, let's put our hands together. It's awesome. Hey, we're so thankful that you've joined us today. If you're here and you need prayer for anything, doesn't matter what it is, we're gonna have some, a prayer team available up here up front. And before you slip out the back doors, come this way, let them pray for you. We believe that prayer matters. I say it every week, but if it matters to you, it matters to God. And so we're gonna take a moment here. We're gonna worship together before we're dismissed. And uh, this is just a time to allow you and really allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And if you don't need prayer for anything, you got a lot to worship today. There's no doubt. And so would you guys just stand up, worship, or prayer team, you can go ahead and head up this way. You can stand up and let's worship together this morning.
give you praise today. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. We just lift up our hearts to you today, and we say thank you. We love you. We give you the praise. We lift you up. You're worthy. You're worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just thank him in your own words. Just take one second, just one minute here, and just thank him. Just let him know what he means to you, what he's done for you. Jesus, you are so powerful to overcome everything in my past, in my life. And I, re I just, I rely on you today because I can't do it on my own. I thank you that you did it for me and you did it perfectly and you did it once and you did it for all, for all times, for everyone. And we thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Celebrate today. Yes. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We are so glad you could come and join us. A couple things real quick. Uh, I don't know if, is anybody interested in seeing the results of the poll from earlier? They can throw that on the screen. I think Pastor said they had that, the live results of that. So if you guys have that, you can click that up there. So there's your results. Looks like a close race on a couple of them, but stress and anxiety. Surprise, surprise. It is 2023. Maybe we'll be hearing more about that in the future then from the pulpit. Um, so we're about to let you guys head out when you do. Grab your kids. Remember, don't leave them for too long because we need to get let the workers get out to be prepared for the egg hunt. Uh, speaking of that, when you do grab your kids, there'll be photo opportunities. There'll be bubbles and popcorn outside. So while they're kind of getting situated, we're going to give about 10 to 15 minute buffer there, and then we're going to start the egg hunt. There'll be signs with their age groups. So you can bring your kids to the right area for, um, you know, because you we have it set up by age. Uh, and then also, when you're done, they can bring the eggs to the overhang right here, the little drive through overhang, to trade those eggs in for candy. There's nothing in the egg right now, but they are worth trading in for some candy. There is, what I've been told, golden eggs that will have prizes. I don't know if they're in, in it or you change I think you change it out for a prize. I think it's all that way. So let them bring the eggs back up here and exchange that for candy and prizes. Everybody with me? We good? All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to go out there, we're going to get our kids. Don't forget if you're exiting, exit out this way. And we love you guys. We are so excited to have you today. God bless you. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Y'all go. Be blessed.